Hi everyone, you are now tuning in to another episode of Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. Our special guest today is cinematographer and director of photography, also known as DP, Seamus Tierney. We hope you enjoy part one of this two-part discussion. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. We are here with Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. I am super excited because we have Seamus Tierney here. You know, um, you worked on a slew of projects in filmmaking as director of photography, also known as DP work for places like The Mighty Ducks, Game Changers, Emily in Paris, Uncoupled, and and cinematography work for You, Console Wars, and the list goes on. You've also been in the electrical department and even dabbled in acting, I've seen back in, um, what was that, 2015? I don't know. (laughs) I'm pretty sure it's probably just an extra or something, you know? (laughs) Nah, he was like, no, I was serious about this. But <laughs> but Seamus, let me ask you though, what was the project that you had the most fun on and why? Oh, that's a tough one. I know. Um, it's always yeah. like, oof. I think I think a couple of my earlier sort of Sundance type movies were probably mm-hmm. my favorite, just because good memories. Uh you know, independent film is always a slog and tough but i think Mm -hmm. the the hardship makes for great camaraderie and memories and stuff so i I would say some of those movies like happy thank you more please which i did with josh bradner uh did two movies with him and then the other one that was crazy fun Mm -hmm. was a movie called like father with Mm. um what genre are these that's they're they're sort of dramedy I guess I would call it you know like uh, that that used to be my wheelhouse it kind of is my wheelhouse I guess um yeah like father was a crazy movie that we shot on a a cruise ship like the it it was the largest cruise ship in the world at the time we shot it and we didn't have the cruise ship it was like a revenue cruise ship so there were still passengers on it oh my goodness I went out to sea for like 23 days not consecutively but 23 days plus all the other stuff we shot so it was a we were stuck in a hurricane with oh Christmas. my goodness and, and was it like back. those things like um for the european films where like they're just staring in the camera they're like what are you doing you know <laughs> when it's the indie project or whatever or did you have to get them to sign releases to film um you know we we brought a bunch of extras and then we okay. also employed people who were on the cruise we were like put up signs everywhere they're like if you want to be an extra in a movie show up at such and such time at such and such place it's actually it was a little easier than it sounds because i don't think you've ever been on a cruise ship but like mm-hmm. when you get into a port everyone gets off and goes and like it, you know, goes to the beach or whatever and so mm-hmm. those the, the ship for the most part is empty so that's when we would film except for our you know we had our extras and anyone who wanted to stay behind and be an extra Oh, like, that's kind of dope, though. I mean, I'm sure it would have been funny if you turned around and it was like the entire ship is looking at you like, <laughs> I'm going to be extras. I'm not getting off. <laughs> honestly, I don't no. think, yeah, honestly, I don't think a lot of the passengers cared that we were there. They're like, we're on vacation. We don't care you're making a movie, you know? <laughs> exactly. I think that's how most um New Yorkers are as well, you know? Yeah, yeah totally. I remember seeing that photo of like um Keanu Reeves on the train. And people are just like, oh, okay, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> he's on the he's on the train. That's nice, you know. <laughs> but totally. I know one um, movie made movie making magic for me that was an inspiration was being in a taxi cab, going through Columbus Circle, and looking into a yellow cab, and someone was just casually holding an Emmy on their lap. Oh my goodness! I was like, and then it was that's- like that magic moment of like we're almost close together and then we go uh, our separate uh, ways and I was like oh my god this is where I want to be yeah. just to have that kind of moment you know yeah yeah and speaking yeah. of that can you let us know like how did you end up getting into the filmmaking profession like what made you passionate enough as well to stay in it so long yeah you know I I kind of always wanted to make movies from when I was a, literally early teens uh, a couple of years ago, one of my oldest friends was like, hey, I remember when we were like 
13 years old and you said, I'm going to make movies. And he was like, you're doing it now. I'm like, yeah, wow. I don't even remember saying that, but yes, I am doing it now. <laughs> that is uh, awesome. Yeah. And, took, and how'd you get started? It took me a little while to get there. Cause I, I, I decided to sort of travel the world and like gain life experience before I got into it. But, um, I grew up in Hawaii and Australia. And then when I came back to America, I came back to the, you know, the mainland uh, and I moved to New York. Uh, and somebody handed me a little like cut out from the village voice, like film PAs wanted. And I had, I didn't even know what a PA was. <laughs> I, I go, I go to this job and I, I was basically like a glorified intern at a, in a low budget indie film. Uh, they, they paid me like 50 bucks a week. And I was, like, <laughs> yes. I, I was like a runner. They gave me like a roll of, uh, subway tokens. So this is still when we had subway tokens. <laughs> Listen, we're not showing our age, but we're showing our age and no <laughs> one cares. Anyone listening right now, you're paying almost three damn dollars to get on the train. Don't be a hater. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So I, but I was coming from Australia. I was scared to ride the subway. So they would, they would say, go, go take this thing this way. And so instead of taking the subway, I would like literally run across Manhattan to, to drop off whatever I had to drop off. And then <laughs> anyway, long story short, we get into production, we start shooting and, and you know, about three days in, uh, the Grip Electric folks were like, hey, we're short staffed. And I would, I would sort of sit there and watch them. And I was like, oh, they're calling for some, this piece of equipment they need some wedges for the dolly track and i would be okay instead of bringing them one i would bring them three or four because i knew they'd need more and slowly i sort of started to catch on so after the first couple of weeks the gaffer was like uh he no longer is a pa he doesn't have to set up crap service we have he's coming with us and oh, i kind of like, he took me under his wing that guy uh tom hamilton is a great gaffer he took me under his wing and i i literally started working as an electrician um and i did that in new york for about seven years but in there towards the end i sorry long story short i i knew i wanted to be a dp after the first couple of weeks i said i want to do what that person's doing because that's i see I, I can't write but i see in pictures so i want to mm. express my art for lack of a better word in pictures so i started bugging every dp i ever worked for as an electrician i'm just like hey why are you doing that what are you doing which was you know what i mean and just like <laughs> i'm like a sponge sucking it up mm -hmm. so eventually i started shooting for uh nyu kids and uh columbia grad thesis films because at columbia they don't i don't know if they do now but they didn't have a cinematography program it was like writing and directing oh wow um, okay and so they would hire out for dps so I started shooting short films and I must have shot like 30 or 40 of them. I, I tell you, I kid you not. And this was is it back for 50 bucks. <laughs> no, I wasn't getting paid. I was using the money that I was making as an electrician on like mm -hmm. music videos, independent features, commercials mm -hmm. to uh, if the, if the NYU folks or uh, Columbia mostly folks wanted to shoot on 16 mil, cause we still shot film back then mm -hmm. I would pay to shoot on 35 i would pay the difference oh, so wow. that real was more professional looking mm -hmm. so eventually you know i got some awards uh and then i applied to grad school at AFI. i love how casual you are you're all like they got some awards you know whatever. <laughs> upgraded the you know 35 millimeter out of pocket but yeah. <laughs> like, well it, it was kind of it, it, think of it in terms of like building a resume. That's what I was doing. I was building my resume. A portfolio, with, right? A portfolio, yes, correct. Yeah. With the idea of applying to a graduate program and getting in. And I, and I applied to AFI. And I remember I was shooting a short and uh, the head of the program, this amazing cinematographer, Bill Dill, um, called me in the middle of this, one of these shorts I was shooting. And I said, sorry guys, I gotta take this. And I go out into the street and it's like loud in Manhattan. And he's like, Seamus, I, I saw your stuff. I read your essay. I want to ask you one question. Do you okay. want to have a life or a life in film? And I said, I want a life in film. And he said, okay, we'll see you in uh, the beginning of the year. But, and I got in. I was like, well, that is well, such a great success story. That yeah. is amazing. <laughs> you, that is a really nice, um, that's a really nice story. 
because a off. lot of the times you you fit you try and pinpoint when your passion started, right? And it's yeah. like there it is, like <laughs> somebody you respected a lot is like, hey, all right, all this work you put in, getting paid nothing, <laughs> and, yeah. doing, and doing double time has now paid off. And now a word from one of our sponsors. After starting my podcast, I needed to hire the pros to market the content. Are you looking for digital success? Look no further. World Boss HQ is your strategic partner. Their experts turn your vision into a digital masterpiece. From stunning websites to powerful marketing, they've got you covered. Startups or established businesses, they are your one-stop solution. Visit worldbosshq.com. That is W-O-R-L-D-B-O-S-S-H-Q.com and unleash your potential today. World Boss HQ Digital Marketing. Your online empire awaits. We are excited to bring you this world exclusive teaser from Bad Rabbit Pictures and Movie Pods. They are presenting Age of Prophecy, a sci-fi fantasy podcast done in the style of the radio dramas of yesteryear. Coming soon to all streaming platforms. Visit www.moviepods.com or www.thenukechronicles.com for all the release dates. You won't want to miss this one. Your miss were born from our history. Let's check it out. Life, a vile, messy sequence of events before we die. All designed for something beyond us. It has to be, or else what's the point? You don't know me, but I know you. I am responsible for your triumphs and miseries. Zira and Lil Zor, and to truly understand your own story, you must know mine. Your myths were born from my history. Hi there, and welcome back to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. But yeah. for people that might not know, a director of photography, break that down um, for them, like what it is exactly you'd be doing. Sure. So as a director of photography, on set, we can start there and then we can back, mm -hmm. it, back into it a little bit. On set, you are basically the head of uh, three departments the lighting, the grip, and the camera department. Wow. So you have the key grip, your gaffer, and either your operator, if you're not operating, or your first AC. And then all the ACs and all the electricians and all the grips. Uh, and these are the folks that help you set up a shot. And the shots are determined mostly in pre-production with mm -hmm. the, yourself and the director, and potentially an AD or and or a production designer. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you've constructed this blueprint game plan all in pre-production this is say a movie or a tv show and then as the director of photography you're executing that plan visually through the use of the camera the lighting and the grip folks uh so yeah basically that's what you do <laughs> that, that sounds so simple but you know <laughs> it, it, it sounds simple but it is very complex and you're really bringing the vision of what the screenwriter has put together to life pretty much correct yeah you know? which is yeah. really amazing because a lot of times you know that's there's times where people don't focus on that you know especially i would say like in an indie film right you're like yeah 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 they're talking about midnight but we're shooting during the day or whatever we ain't got the budget to be around you right 
but for you, you would like something like stars in the sky, kind of like it looks like the moon is outside setting through the kitchen or something like that, you know? Totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's all like, you know, you're you've you've conceived all these ideas in pre-production, which, you know, like let's say you you're shooting a movie for four weeks. They mm-hmm. usually give you about four weeks of prep. So you've mm-hmm. sat in rooms coming up with ideas in sort of a vacuum. You know what I mean? Like, like how are we going to shoot this? What is this? What is, for me, I was always taught like it's story, story, story. Mm-hmm. So you can make the most beautiful pictures in the world, but if you're not driving the story forward, then you're probably going to miss the point. Mm-hmm. And for me, when I, this is a little bit of a, a other subject, but for me, when I prep a film with a director, mm-hmm. my job is to interpret the idea or the emotion behind a scene Mm -hmm. and then translate that visually. Now there's like, for each scene, there's probably like 20 ways to shoot it. But if you've sat with the director and talked about the emotion or the idea behind the scene, then you can execute that six ways from Sunday. Do you know what I mean? You can figure out how to do it. you know, yes, there's rules that you adhere to based on your story, but you know, anyways, that's kind of my approach. Like what is the idea or the emotion behind a particular scene? And then how do we execute that? And then when we're in production, I use the grip electric and the, uh, uh, sorry, grip lighting and camera to execute that. You know what I mean? I love that though. I mean, because that's really inspiring on, again, going back to your passion, right? Yeah. So it's like tapping into that. It's like, listen, I'm not just showing up and, you know, just following orders. What is the script actually about? What is the mood and the, you know, what are we trying to really go for? And that's going to help me set up the shot. I'm trying, totally. you're pretty much yeah. there to translate the director's vision as well, along with yeah. getting something that the editors can work with. Right. Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So also, I- I- yeah. So give us an idea on like the the equipment you would work with and why, like, you know, I know probably for the indie stuff, but now, you know, you've also done content for the major studios as well, where the budget is a little bit bigger. So yeah. somebody out there would love to probably yeah. hear about the small cameras and the large, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. I mean, you know, look, uh, yes, um, I find it fun and challenging to try and make the most out of the least I've got you know just because it Mm -hmm. pushes you to be creative um especially that's what I kind of miss about those indies it was like no just grab me that that sheet off the bed and we'll bounce a light into it and then you know it'll be like like simple and easy and and not get in the way of the actors doing moving around the room so I still try and hold on to that as much as I can even on a bigger budget Mm -hmm. It's just with a bigger budget, you have a little bit more money to make it, to make that a piece of equipment slightly bigger and -hmm. potentially easier. It doesn't always make it easier. Sometimes it complicates it, but to be more specific gear, you know, what I've normally been shooting with now is it's sort of trendy to shoot um, large format. So like a Alexa LF is my camera of choice. And to explain to your listeners, large format is kind of like, um, if you have a normal 35 millimeter movie, large format is taking it, taking the resolution a little bit higher. Mm. Um, it so gets like you- 4K, you mean? Exactly, yeah, 4K mm. or 8K now. You can even shoot on 8K, not that you can see 8K because nobody has an 8K projector and or TV yet, but it's probably coming. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> So it's it's about resolution and the problem. This is I'm totally gonna nerd out about this, but the problem with <laughs> so much resolution is the image becomes hyper real, and mm-hmm. you, I I feel like you tend to lose a little bit of that cinematic quality. So there's a bunch of tricks that we all use to combat that hyper real look, whether it's mm-hmm. like older vintage lenses on new cameras with a sensor that's so sharp and or filters that you put in front of that lens to to soften the image also happens in the lighting you know you can use a softer lighting or a hard back edge and then you know not too much fill light 
So it, it, there's a bunch of tricks in the bag that you can use to keep the image looking cinematic, even though these cameras nowadays are so advanced and sharp and high resolution. You know what I mean? I yeah. remember when I watched my first, um, I think it was an NBA game. It was like sports event on 1080. And, you know, I had the big screen TV and I said, this is weird because you could see the sweat, the pimples, <laughs> the everything, you know, on these guys. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to like this. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah. some of these formats is just a little bit too right. high def and too close up camera. Um, kind of stuff. So I think that's really nice that you have those tricks and everything, you know? Um, that is really amazing though, because yeah. uh, it's, yeah. it's insight that people behind the scenes don't know and to go outside of the box and be creative like that as well. You know, yeah. don't just, yeah. you're pretty much saying, don't just let someone hand you a piece of equipment, try and master it as well. Yeah, totally. And, and, yeah. and master it and like almost break it. You know what I mean? Like don't follow... A, a rule in a book that tells you how to either light something or how to shoot something. And yes, there are language, cinema language, but it's also, it's there to be broken and experimented with and like mm -hmm. molded to your own particular aesthetic. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, an exciting message from our sponsors. When I decided to launch this podcast, I had the tools to find talent and market the show, but needed a skilled editor to bring it all to life. That's when I turned to Jacob Daly at RedHawk.uk. His collaborative approach and swift revisions transformed my vision into reality. RedHawk.uk, your one-stop solution for creative content services. Reach out to them. Hi there, and welcome back to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. I'm also loving your website, um, by the way. If you wouldn't mind letting the audience know uh, the name of that, Spelling, spelling it out for them, www. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, my website, I'm changing to a new one. Oh, okay. I don't have it officially launched yet. So is it okay if I wait on that? I can give you that Absolutely. info. Absolutely. You can definitely, once we, okay. once we launch this bad boy and everything. Okay. But if you're looking for him, um, Seamus, S-E-A-M-U-S, -S, um, Tierney, T-I-E-R-N-E-Y, look up his imdb check him out i think you're probably on linkedin and all the other social channels and stuff like that if you yeah. want to follow him um as well because i love being able to promote excellent people in this industry who you know are definitely working hard the current website i love i can't wait to see the new one because oh the new be... one's even better oh my, oh, my gosh will you please yeah, yeah. design mine <laughs> um <laughs> but i see that you're a creative and art director and also commercial ad content as well you know how did you incorporate this into your portfolio oh uh you talk about like um there's and another you do content for different brands and all that so you're filming for brands as well it's not just like tv and film episodic stuff correct maybe you know you, you might, there's another Seamus Tierney oh what that, I'm that, apologizing you guys it does uh, sort of graphic uh, uh, content like that, like uh, creates content for um, commercials and stuff. That listen, might be- Seamus Tierney <laughs> out there, get off of my guy's stuff. You know, listen, I He's know actually you might really have been cool named dude. that. He's a really cool dude. We've run into each other a couple of times. He's like, no you're way. Shameless, you're Seamus Tierney. Yeah, yeah. Because he also lives in Los Angeles and I have like, I literally ran into him on the street. We had a mutual friend and it was like, wow, small world. Oh you know. my goodness. So I'm promoting that tyranny stuff. Yeah, as well. yeah. This stuff actually rocks, bro, with the commercial yeah. ad. Look, it would be dope if you actually hired Seamus and Seamus. Come up yeah. with a company, meter production and TV commercial ad company, Seamus and Seamus. And yeah, people would totally. be like, what is this? A law firm? No. <laughs> an Irish law firm. Yeah. <laughs> Irish law firm. You are crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my God. I, this is, this is what I'm saying. This is what I love, you know, now, if you can for the audience, you know, yeah. with what you do, which is pretty much multitasking in a very creative way, I would say, because I've worked in corporate as like a project manager is managing a lot of people on assets and launching product, but on a film set, it's, 
project managers all over that bad boy, such as, you know, you as a DP, then you got the producer that's managing a lot of things, you know, the director's managing set and his whole team, second AD, first AD and all of that stuff. Could you elaborate for us, um, you know, what the day, what an average day looks like for you? If you were going on, say, the set of you or something like that, or Emily in Paris and, and you're walking on set, what does that look like for someone like you? Yeah, it's funny you say that, that you sort of phrase that way, because it is the d- the day is a bit of a negotiation, like all day long, <laughs> you know, because <what laughs> I mean? you're you're there and, you know, you've got uh, you've got your script for the day. You've got your schedule for the day provided by the AD and they've broken the day down into like, we're going to be on this scene for this amount of hours and we have this many shots within that scene and you've only got that amount of time to get it. So mm-hmm. Take Emily and take Emily in Paris for an example, because that was kind of the last big thing that I did and, and about to start a new season if the strike goes away. Listen, so, there's no if, let me tell you, it's billions when? of billions of dollars on the line. <laughs> If we could say to not be working, even London, unfortunately, UK, I'm so sorry to say it. They released an article. I think it was Variety that said their industry is suffering right now. So wow. there's no if it's going to end. It's definitely going to end because okay. someone's going to start losing money very soon. And it's and it's not going to be us. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? It's like yeah. the studios are going to have to definitely pivot, you know? So... Oh. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. That's okay, a so, whole nother topic, people. Yeah, totally. That's a, that's a <laughs> several hour podcast. Um, so, <laughs> Emily in Paris, you know, you, the, the thing with that show is the show is, is not only about the actors as characters, but it's also yeah. about Paris. It's also about mm-hmm. the fact. And so what they're wearing, what they look like and their hair. So that takes up a, like straight out of the gate, that takes up a huge chunk of the day. God forbid, God forbid you have a costume change in the middle of the day that's like an yeah. hour and a half of your 10 hour day gone and in Paris you can't work over 10 hours thank goodness I'm <laughs> super happy about that um yeah so you know then then it comes to me and and the AD is like okay well you've got such and such amount of time to make your day and there is no margin for error because you only have your actors for a small window during that day so my day is, a, like I said, is a negotiation with my whole crew. Like, we have to light this thing. Can we light it in a half an hour? Can we set up the dolly track for the shot within the time that we're given before the actor shows up? And then how quickly can we pivot and move to the next thing? So it's constantly a negotiation of time and, and, and how much I can set up, how much uh, I can invest, how many shots we can get within a scene. You know what I mean? So it's all about working with the team, my grip, lighting, camera, director, AD, about how to manage that time. So every day is uh, basically a, a negotiation about how to do that. And yes, you've planned quite a lot of, it, of that out in pre-production, but there's always something that's going to be uh, a wild card. Like, oh, we, we can't get into that location. We can't look that way because there's too much, you know, uh, people walking around or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or the sun's coming in a different place. And, you know, so like I said, every day you're, you're figuring out how to manage people, places, and all the gear that you've ordered. You know what I mean? And did you order the right stuff? You know, hopefully you did. You know, I don't know. It's it's a it's crazy. But it's a, that's but then, where- Then you're sending somebody as a runner like yourself across- ah. <laughs> New York to run a task. You're like, listen, I need for you to go to the camera yeah. shop. Uh, what is yeah. a really large camera shop over there in um in New York? There, yes, in thirty four. Huh? Barbizon, maybe? Or B and H? No, B and H. B and H. That place is a magical place. Yeah. Shout out to B and H camera, please. Yes. Because you can go in there and find any and everything. The first time I wandered in there. I think the AMC theater is like right down the street. Yep, right around the corner. Yep. And I'm an AMC theater fanatic as well. I I used to go to the movies at least twice a week. (laughs) You know, it was at a point where I'd sneak off at lunchtime and be like, you know what? You've been here early. I'm going to go watch a movie, you guys. Like, you know, and um, 
but that was, you know, after years of years of working somewhere, you're just like, I just need a break. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that little area. Yeah. And yeah. BH, you can get lost in there. You can get oh, lost. Oh my God. So you're right. It is magical. It is beyond magic because they even have the broadcast cameras in there. So mm -hmm. The major broadcast, like the large, large. Listen, B and H, if you want to be a sponsor, holler at Vonti as much as I'm plugging you right now in New York. But um, that place is really great. And I love that, you know, it's pretty much, it's somewhat of a domino effect, but how you pivot, right? And and that's something. Totally, yeah, totally. Yeah. That I yeah. mentioned, but, yeah. But, you know, for me, it's like that, therein lies the juice. Like, mm -hmm. I love when... To, to be honest when not when something goes wrong but when mm -hmm. like you have to solve a problem on the fly there's nothing more rewarding than accomplishing that you know uh feat of like oh man like there was one night on emily in paris we got to this location and we're, we're shooting this thing along a canal and it's nighttime and it's you know and i had planned to have these big lights in the distance to backlight the actors and i get there and the locations person's like uh, I was like, oh, let's turn on the lights. And the guy's like, oh, uh, we don't have a generator. I'm like, what? I'm like, well, what do you mean we don't have a generator? And, uh, we, we planned this like weeks in advance. We, we yeah, you're like, that's the least of you. <laughs> yeah, like, we, how are we going to power the lights? And um, it was this whole thing. And I'm like, oh, man, okay, well, do we have anything that runs on a battery? And so we, we pivoted, but, and it turned out to look, I think it looks pretty darn good for not, for like not the original plan we had but it you know mm -hmm. like sort of a on the fly plan so it's stuff like that at the end of the day you're like oh man but if it turns out you're like that was kind of cool we had to make something out of nothing like macgyver it you know what i mean like some 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 duct tape and chewing gum and a match <laughs> <laughs> i miss that show i wish somebody would do an updated version of macgyver because that yeah. was my show right there right yeah yep. that yeah. and inspector gadget right oh yeah Remember that one oh my I goodness totally yeah, yeah the, that is too funny though but i think that is something that people you know especially all young kids coming up need to understand you need to be able to pivot you need to be able to problem solve right analyze yeah. the situation not yeah. um let the stress overwhelm you as well and understand that you are part of a team i will say okay. from working on set it's really much a team you know sometimes people's heads will get hot but at the end of the day you guys are always trying to make the the most exceptional product of course yeah and that's another that was another lesson i learned very early on was to like you can lean on the people around you mm -hmm. because they're for the most part they are there to make a good product at the end of the day you know, I mean, for lack of a better word, they want to make the, they don't want to come to work. Most, most people in film, like you wouldn't do this job unless you kind of loved it to some degree, because it's a hard job. It's hard to get into. There's no guarantee of success financially and or like personally rewarding. But mm -hmm. we, I feel like people who do it, they do it for the love. You know what I mean? Cause it's like, it, it is something that I've, I've always been in love with and like secret be told, I would do this for free. Don't tell my agent that, but I would literally do this for free. I would go to work as long as they could give me food and a place to stay. I would do <laughs> it for the rest of my life for free. I love that though, you know, yeah. because that, that just shows the passion. You know, I've worked at companies where we're building out a product and they don't care. You know, they don't even care about the end yeah. game, what the goal is. And it's so disheartening because you always want to put your best foot forward. So that's sure. something really important to to realize. It's like this industry is a lot of ups and downs, but if you're passionate about it, it doesn't feel like work, right? Yeah. And and to my point, it's like like when I started realizing, oh, look, I can lean on these other folks because they're like-minded. And then you let them, you give, you know, you say, hey, what do you think? Or, you know, how do you want to do this? Or, and then, then you see them flourish. You see them open and then like, it's, it's like, the best idea wins at the end of the day. Do you know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. They're like, bro, we got a generator over here. I didn't know you needed yeah. one. You're like, bring it now. No, <laughs> Which is yeah. really excellent though. Yeah, yeah. 
You've just tuned into an episode of Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. We'd like to thank our guests for joining us and sharing their knowledge. This has been a production of Vonti Pictures, hosted by me, Vonti McCray, a screenwriter and producer. We'd also like to thank Bad Rabbit Pictures for the animated content and creator of upcoming podcast, Age of Prophecy along with our sponsor, RedHawk.uk, with all episodes being edited by Jacob Daly, director, producer, and a man of many talents. Come back next week as this saga continues for the Conversations with Filmmakers podcast.